Uh, I'm very, uh, very pleased that uh, Tarkoit would come uh, uh, and talk to us today. I called it a dialogue and conversation and so on. And what I meant by that is that he could make some remarks and then you could ask some questions. And uh, hopefully uh, that would be great. So I'll ask uh, Professor Dunwoody to come up and introduce our guest. And now I'm a little bit worried about the, if you try to leave early, you'll be in trouble because what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, uh, introduce our next uh, participant and then leave. <laughs> uh, because I have another, I have a schizophrenic life here. I have a second job that is totally indifferent to what's happening here in the Pile Center and I have uh, meetings all afternoon uh, up in Bascom. But I, I still treasure the opportunity to uh, spend the next uh, minute or so introducing somebody who I think we're going to be uh, uh, delighted to hear from uh, Clark Hoyt. Uh, the analytical bones of a media organization are actually no more apparent than in the work of those people who are tasked to interact and respond to audiences, uh, work that's represented uh, today by our, our next speaker, uh, uh, NYT public editor Clark Hoyt. Uh, the, uh, this, that, state, that sentence is not to trivialize the monumental evidentiary work that goes on at newspapers like the New York Times when it comes to investigative journalism, uh, thoughtful commentary, and the Times is uh, lauding those efforts even now th uh, thanks to the recent announcement of the Pulitzers. But rather my point is that the work of a public editor or as we used to call in those less appealing days ombudspersons, uh, the work of a public editor is to make his or her analytical scaffolding absolutely obvious to people. It is the job of a public editor to weigh evidence and to do so and in, and in an entirely transparent way. Uh, this is hard as the individuals who prompt these evidentiary adventures interpret information through lenses forged by their own robust beliefs. Uh, I think it unlikely that Clark's reflections on the nature of such things as the Times coverage of the possible link between autism and vaccines will be embraced by those readers who are already convinced that such a link is real. But the rest of us value these deliberations enormously and that is the ultimate service. That's the ultimate role of someone like Clark, whose job is to make issues of evidence as transparent as possible. Um, Clark was named public editor of the New York Times two years ago, but stepped into the position from a lifelong uh, embrace of newspaper journalism. Soon after becoming a reporter in 1966, he signed on to do journalism for the Detroit Free Press and began a relationship with the Knight Ritter chain that lasted for nearly 40 years, would you say 38 last night, 38 years. Among his many positions with the company um, uh, and its newspaper properties were serving as national correspondent, managing editor of the Wichita Eagle Beacon, news editor of the Washington Bureau, vice president for news, and from 1999 until the sale of uh, Knight Ritter to the McClatchy chain in 2006, Washington editor with responsibility for the Washington Bureau and the editorial operations of Knight Ritter Tribune Information Services. Uh, in 1973, Clark shared the Pulitzer Prize for National Reporting with Robert Boyd for their coverage of Democratic vice presidential nominee Thomas Eagleton's history, remember this one, of treatment for severe depression. In 2004, he received the John S. Knight Gold Medal, uh, which is Knight Ritter's highest employee award. Uh, he is currently director of the Foundation of the American Society of Newspaper Editors and a former chairman of the National Press Foundation. It's a pleasure to have him on the premises, and I'm very sorry to miss what's going to happen over the next hour and a half, but uh, uh, let's welcome Clark. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Sharon, thank you very much. Um, this has been a wonderful conference. Uh, I really feel very privileged to be here. Stephen, this is really, the program is terrific and, and uh, a lot of food for thought in this. 
Um, I think a gathering like this is especially valuable at a time of great turbulence and uncertainty in the news business. Uh, a time when uh, this morning's first question uh, I noted was whether news organizations can even afford to have ethics anymore. Uh, of course, my answer is the same as the one we heard, which is uh, they can and they must if, they're, if anything is to survive of journalism. I'm honored by this invitation, but um, I wondered if you knew what you were doing. Um, after all, I, uh, and I'll quote uh, the publisher of the New York Times uh, on this, must be dumber than I look. <laughs> That's the way he greeted me nearly two years ago at the start of my stint as public editor. Clapped his hands on his knees and said, you must be dumber than you look. He, he was joking, I, I think. I knew that becoming a newspaper ombudsman, especially the ombudsman of the liberal New York Times, you know that is its official title in many, in many quarters, would put me on a firing line. Here is a sample from this week's reader email, and I'll try to get the tone of voice right from, for this. It is pathetic how much the public editor has become the chief apologist, only willing to slap the Times' wrist over trivial side issues. That was from Cynthia Jacobson of Phoenix. Last week, Mike Hodanish of Jackson, New Jersey, asked me, have you ever considered writing a column that is positive toward the newspaper? After all, you are the public editor, not the public critic, right? I bet the negative slant in most of your columns is not shared by the public you supposedly represent. We all know that newspapers are in trouble. Most of it is economic, the recession, <coughs> demographic, young people don't read printed print on paper as much. Technological, the internet makes every individual a potential publisher. And it is a combination of all of these. Nobody has figured out how to make enough money from online advertising to support large, robust news staffs and make a profit. But I also think some of our troubles are distilled in those two messages I just read that seem to come from parallel universes. A newspaper like the Times works hard to shoot straight, to report the news fairly and accurately, it may not always succeed, but that is its goal. But in our increasingly polarized world, where the middle ground seems to be rapidly disappearing, witness Senator Arlen Specter's conversion to the Democratic Party on Tuesday, a lot of people do not want their news straight or distrust or ignore news organizations that try to deliver it that way. They would certainly disagree with what I just posed as the issue, but that's how I see it from where I sit. As the public editor of the New York Times, I hear every day from readers who say they know exactly what has caused the newspaper crisis. On one side, it's readers who blame the liberal bias of the Times. For others, believe it or not, it's the paper's conservative bias, what they see as its role as voice of the establishment. I can't tell you how many messages to me start off with some version of no wonder the New York Times is losing readers and having financial troubles. Some can't hide their schadenfreude at what is happening to newspapers, and they say quite blithely that they can't wait for the day when, times, uh, when newspapers like the Times go under. I wonder if they know what they're wishing for, a day when Bill O'Reilly on Fox is their source for fair and balanced news, or Keith Olbermann on MSNBC. In this atmosphere, uh, let me take a few minutes and give you an idea of what it's like to be an ombudsman at what I think is the nation's greatest newspaper. The New York Times has some of the most engaged readers and some of the harshest critics you can imagine. Some of them read the Times and have very thoughtful critiques of it. Some of them do not read it but know just why they hate it all the same. <laughs> I'm the shock absorber between these critics and journalists, some of whom can be just as thin-skinned def and defensive as anyone else. And this being America in the 21st century, the criticisms are not always expressed in polite and temperate language, and sometimes the responses are not either. Um, let me just take a moment and share with you, uh, from yesterday's email, uh, a lady uh, sent to me an exchange she had with a Times reporter. He was uh, in Afghanistan and had covered a, um, uh, an ambush by the Taliban of an American unit. 
Uh, he was crouched in a field of poppies for two to three hours while thousands of bullets rained in from three sides. And the unit, as it was running low on ammunition, was rescued by helicopter gunships. This woman read his story about the firefight and wrote to him and said, uh, Mr. Filkins, um, it's terrible that you would exaggerate in the New York Times by writing that the poppies were shoulder high. I'm a gardener and poppies don't grow that high. And perhaps if you went on the internet and looked at some poppies, you realize your error. Uh, the reporter sent her back a uh, reply and he said, the internet is nice, but being there beats it. <laughs> she wasn't going to take that for an answer, so she wrote back to him and said, um, many academic studies have proven that eyewitness accounts are completely unreliable. <laughs> and uh, therefore, your answer does not wash with me. Uh, and then she proceeded to explain about poppies again. Well, he sent her back a pretty intemperate response. And then she wrote to me, the public editor, and said, well, what do you think about this? This is so rude of the New York Times to treat me this way. And I sent it to his editor, who in turn got so angry that she, I said, would you like to respond to him? I don't really speak for the paper, and you know, you're his boss. And uh, she said to me, um, I, I don't think I could write the kind of response you'd like to read. Um, and uh, so I answered her and, and just asked her to switch places with him and describe the circumstances under which he operated. And then I sent her some photographs of uh, the soldiers in shoulder-high poppies. <laughs> if I agree with anyone making a complaint, um, they think I'm pretty smart. If I don't, I am a sellout hanging on for a paycheck or a left-wing radical, or a right-wing tool of corporate journalism, or some other manifestation of corruption. As a lady once told me, I am an evil person without any standards whatsoever, and she knows that I made a pact with the devil at a very young age. <laughs> she said she had read the work of all five public editors at the New York Times, and I was by far the worst. I replied that there had been only three public editors, <laughs> including me. She said, stop being so sensitive. <laughs> this is a unique job. It has no written job description. I have no boss, not Bill Keller, the executive editor, and not Arthur Sulzberger, the publisher, who thought I must be dumber than I looked. I'm an independent contractor, not an employee of the newspaper, and nobody can tell me what to do or how to do it. To be considered for the job, I could never have previously worked at the New York Times. When I am finished being the public editor, I can never work again for the paper in any capacity. According to my contract, I can be fired for only two reasons. If I just don't do anything at all, or if I violate the written ethics policies of the newspaper. On my first day there, I went in the men's room and I realized there might be a third reason if I smoked in the men's room. There is no written job description, but I think Keller subbed up, summed up the mission of the public editor nicely when he said it is to hold the New York Times to its own high standards of journalism. This is a role you may recall that was created in the wake of the Jason Blair scandal at the Times. Blair was a rogue reporter who made things up in violation of every canon of journalism and whose rapid rise and fall led to a major shakeup within the Times and a serious examination of its culture and practices to find out how and why such a thing could have happened and how it could be prevented in the future. I am, as I said, the third public editor, not the fifth. The first was Daniel Okrent, an author and longtime editor at Time Incorporated, who was an especially gifted writer and set a very high standard at the outset. The second was Byron Kalame, who had just retired as a senior editor of the Wall Street Journal after a long and distinguished career at that great newspaper. Both have said they encountered a fair amount of hostility at the Times. Okrant wrote a book about his experience, and the title gives you some idea of how he was received. It was called Public Editor Number One. <laughs> he described a hostile meeting with the Washington Bureau where he was so pummeled with skeptical questions about his role and qualifications that he left bathed in sweat. 
He described another meeting with the business news staff where a famous reporter shouted him down abusively. This wasn't necessarily surprising. With reason, the Times hold it, holds itself in high regard, and there is a strong impulse in the newsroom culture to resist any criticism from an outsider, who, after all, some would say, hadn't been good enough to work at the Times in the first place. <laughs> One senior editor warned me before I arrived that that was exactly how I would be received. But by the time I got there, nearly two years ago, I discovered that Okrent and Kalame had worn down a lot of the resistance and paved the way for their successors. The culture was more accepting of examination by a public editor, or at least more accustomed to it or more resigned to it. And my reception has been unfailingly professional. Sometimes it's been cordial. Other times it has been very chilly, depending on the individual and the issue of the moment. And occasionally there have been histrionics, as when a journalist told me that she would have to check into the hospital if I wrote what I was contemplating about a piece of her work. I did write it, and she did not check into the hospital. I think I know how a member of the Internal Affairs Division of a police department feels. More than one person has said something like, I enjoy your work, just don't write about me. Even the location of my office was a matter of controversy when I arrived. The previous two public editors had lived in splendid isolation on the 10th floor of the old New York Times building on 43rd Street, many floors away from the newsroom, down a long, dark corridor, past long lines of metal cabinets holding dead files, just before the door leading to the mechanical equipment for the elevators. <laughs> when the Times moved to its new trophy building on 8th Avenue about a month after my arrival, I asked Keller to be brought in from Siberia to a place more convenient to the newsroom. He is an old foreign correspondent, and he said he couldn't promise me Paris. I said Prague would be fine. <laughs> After what I later learned were some tense negotiations with no department wanting me anywhere near, I was assigned an office right next to the staff that assembles the weekly announcements of weddings. <laughs> I have enjoyed my neighbors, and it has been an eye-opening experience to see how thoroughly they report those Times wedding notices in the Sunday Style section. This is a real conversation I overheard on one of the first days we were there. So you say you have an MBA from Columbia. Can you prove it? There was a long silence, and I can just imagine the shock on the other end. You know, this is my wedding announcement. I feel like I'm on trial. Um, and then after the silence, well, acceptable proof would be a faxed copy of your diploma, or you could authorize the university to release a transcript to me. My assistant, Michael McElroy, has observed that if all of the times were reported with as much painstaking care, there would have been no need for a public editor. <laughs> with the exception of Bill Keller and his two managing editors, nobody in the newsroom of the Times is obliged to deal with me in any way, but almost everyone answers my questions even when they are received as irritating or embarrassing. That includes a news assistant responsible for misspelling a name and a world-famous columnist unused to being second-guessed by some outsider. I have no executive authority at the Times. I do not see articles before they are, uh, go in the newspaper. I do not attend daily news meetings or meetings to plan longer-term coverage. I cannot tell the newspaper what to publish, not even a correction of an obvious error. I have no say of any kind over personnel matters, even though until he was let go at the start of uh, this year, a large proportion of the readers who wrote to me on any given Monday wanted William Crystal fired immediately. His conservative replacement, Ross, Ross Douthout, has made his debut this week, even, and I have received only one complaint so far, even though his first column posed the provocative thesis that Dick Cheney should have been the Republican nominee against uh, Barack Obama. Many people don't realize how my job is structured. I'm currently being sued in India by one of the world's richest men who apparently thinks I had some responsibility for an article about his brother, an even richer man, in which uh, this fellow was mentioned. He is demanding $2 billion from the New York Times and several individuals, including me. Dealing with the newsroom is only part of my job. Dealing with the public, of course, I'm the reader's representative, is a big part of it. I have been in the news business at many levels for a long time, and I have long been used to complaints from subjects of news stories who believe they were unfairly treated 
or from readers objecting to some aspect of news coverage. But none of that really prepared me for what I've encountered at the Times. The concerns of readers range from cosmic to weird to nitpicky. Why did the newspaper appear biased toward Obama in the 2008 election? Why doesn't it use honorifics on the sports pages? You know, it's Mr. Madoff in the A section, but Jeter in sports. Last year, a man wrote that he has been submitting unsolicited op-ed articles to the Times for years, and none have been published. He sent a bill to the op-ed editor for $20,000 to compensate for all the time he has expended trying to break into the paper. <laughs> When he didn't get what he wanted, he wrote to me and said that upon reconsideration, he now wants $40,000. <laughs> One reader this week called to my attention a uh, 2003 article in which the name of the parody rock band Spinal Tap was spelled with an umlaut over the N in spinal. This is from 2003. I'm not making this up. He thought that was great because most newspapers didn't spell it that way, and the band had added those two little dots over the end to make fun of groups like Motley Crue and Blue Oyster Cult. I didn't have the heart to tell him that it had been a mistake, and it's never <laughs> appeared that way in the paper since. Usage issues can actually turn into debates of great substance. I wrote last week about how the Times have changed its description of the Bush administration's techniques for interrogating uh, terrorism suspects. The administration had described, uh, uh, the administration, as you know, had used this term enhanced interrogation uh, to describe things like slapping people, stripping them naked, slamming them up against walls, keeping them awake for up to 11 straight days, uh, sometimes with their hands chained above their heads, putting them on a liquid di uh, diet, and finally waterboarding them. The Times had called all of this harsh. But after the release of the so-called torture memos earlier this month, harsh uh, became brutal in the Times, and a lot of readers noticed. Many readers thought the newspaper was becoming political uh, by adopting that term uh, and, and said it had no business using any descriptor to describe these. Other readers thought the newspaper was retreating into euphemism and demanded that it use the word torture and adopt it as its own language. Uh, it, it, that is the word the editorial page uses, but not the, uh, not the news pages. I personally think waterboarding is torture. There are centuries of precedents that say it is. Uh, but I wrote last week that I thought the newspaper was right to be careful and restrained with language in the midst of a heated debate. Uh, I have heard from a lot of readers, and very few of them agree with that. Because there is a small cottage industry on the internet devoted to critiquing virtually every word in the Times, there is also a large public out there ready to pounce on every perceived sin the newspaper commits. Many of these people who are not necessarily readers of the Times are nonetheless free with their criticism and can be very abusive. Sometimes they're funny, even if unintentionally. One of my favorite messages began like this. I wish I subscribed to your newspaper so that I could cancel my subscription. Another man said he did not read the Times, but his mother did, and he was trying to get her to cancel her subscription, but she was ignoring him. On, the, on a slow day in the heat of summer, the public editor can get uh, maybe only 150 messages from the public. An average day is 300. A really busy day can be 2,000, especially if a blog uh, has inspired uh, some following or other to get angry at something that's been in the newspaper. I write the column three weeks out of four, and the fourth is letters from readers. Um, and in doing this, I've dealt with subjects that you could predict and some that have really surprised me. Since I've been on the job, the Times, with all of its layers of careful editing, has been the victim of two hoaxes. In one, the newspaper published the obituary of a photographer who had claimed he took that iconic photograph of young John Kennedy saluting his father's casket. For years, the man had fooled family, friends, and an art gallery dealing in his work. But when his obituary was published, along with the picture, I heard immediately from a network of retired United Press International photographers who knew that it was one of their own who had taken the photograph. The sad thing is that the Times had in its own electronic archive a copy of the picture that was labeled correctly as to its origin. 
and a simple check would have saved the newspaper a lot of embarrassment. And then, more recently, again because of a failure to check, the Times published a review of a book purporting to be the memoir of a young white woman separated from her parents by a cruel juvenile services bureaucracy and raised in the gang culture of South Central Los Angeles. The paper subsequently visited the woman in Oregon and wrote a feature about her home and how she'd gotten out of all this. But she was a complete fraud, a middle-class suburbanite with a vivid imagination and an apparent fascination with gang culture. And some skeptical, careful checking could have prevented embarrassment. I, I had a researcher go online and it took, it took exactly five minutes to unmask her through property records. I never expected to be dealing with an issue like sexually uh, suggestive photographs of an underage fashion model, but I did. The Times' hugely successful magazine for high-end fashion, T, published pictures of a partially unclothed 17-year-old model that a few readers and I thought crossed the line, and I wrote about it. The model's mother was a passionate and articulate defender of the photographs. She had chaperoned her daughter during the shoot and regarded the pictures as tasteful and artistic. The readers I heard from thought they came close to softcore pornography. The most famous column I think I've written was published more than a year ago, right after the Times ran a front page article detailing John McCain's relationships with Washington lobbyists, a particularly newsworthy topic given his emphasis in his presidential campaign on cleaning up Washington's lobbyist-ridden culture. In its second paragraph, the article said that some of McCain's staffers believed that he had had a romantic relationship with one of those lobbyists, an attractive woman more than 30 years his junior. It said that these staffers were so concerned that they had warned the senator and took steps to keep her away from him. There were no on-the-record sources for these suspicions, and there was no compelling evidence in the article that any affair had actually taken place. Bill Keller and other editors defended the article on the grounds that it wasn't about an affair. They said it was about the senator's judgment in having a relationship with a lobbyist that could appear to some in his circle to be an affair. I was critical of the article because I read it the way I think most readers did, raising the implication of an affair without establishing that one happened. The lobbyist sued the Times for defamation and made my column a central part of her pleadings in it. As in, even the newspaper's own public editor said, the case settled recently and I was relieved because it seemed clear that we were heading toward a big legal fight over whether a newspaper's ombudsman could be turned into a plaintiff's witness against it. If the suit had continued, I think it could have posed a threat to the very idea of news ombudsman. What news organization could afford to harbor in its midst a potential witness against it? What would happen if every time an ombudsman did his job of assessing how well the organization's reporters and editors performed on a given story, he was looking over his shoulder for the process server? I said that readers perceive bias in the Times. Dan Okrent, the first public editor, wrote a famous column in which he posed the question, is the Times a liberal newspaper? And he answered it, of course it is. My answer is a little bit different. The Times is, in the broadest sense, a liberal newspaper. And let me explain what I mean by that. The Times reflects a liberal cultural outlook consistent with the city and region where it is published and where it has half of its circulation. It puts same-sex unions in the wedding announcements. It does not give credence to creationism or intelligent design on its science pages. It accepts that human activity is leading to global warming. It writes without judgment about social phenomena that many conservatives deplore. I, I heard complaints, for example, about a recent Times Magazine cover story on the nature of women's sexual desire. Keller once told me, I like to say we are liberal in the sense that a liberal arts college is liberal, generally secular in outlook, disinclined to take things on faith, non-dogmatic, tolerant of and curious about a wide range of views and behaviors. Many studies have found over the years that journalists are more socially and politically liberal than the population at large, and I see no evidence that Times journalists are any different. But journalis journalism has professional norms that are supposed to filter out the personal biases of reporters and editors, and the Times has layers of editors who share that responsibility. 
I do think I've seen bias creep through, but I also think I have seen coverage, including the coverage of last year's presidential election, that was far better and more fair than the newspaper's critics would admit. You know, um, I, I was going to talk a bit about the, the economics of the business, but I think at this point I'd really rather segue into a conversation. If you all have things, and if you want to talk some about business and the, middle, the some of the economic challenges the, the industry faces, I'd be glad to talk about that. But let's, let's stop at this point and see if um, anyone has questions, remarks. Uh, And I'll come back to the bloggers back there, too. How likely is it that columns like yours will simply disappear because of the financial implications that it could come back to a, a, a real financial obligation in, in terms of a lawsuit? Well, columns like mine are already disappearing even without that threat. I think the threat only uh, makes the danger uh, potentially some, some higher. Um, the truth is the number of, uh, of ombudsmen at uh, American newspapers is declining pretty sharply. Uh, I can't begin to tell you the number of papers that have discontinued it as they've gone through cost-cutting, eliminating movie critics, book reviews, uh, 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 so, so much of the content of papers. One of the things that often winds up uh, on the cutting room floor is the, uh, is the role of a, of a public editor or an ombudsman. Uh, the Boston Globe has discontinued it. Um, uh, the newspaper that began the practice, the Louisville Courier Journal, no longer has one. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very uh, disheartening trend. And more financial than yes. Well, it's more financial, but I think it's one of those things where uh, most newsrooms aren't terribly comfortable with it, and uh, so when finances uh, can come into play, there's probably another little thumb up that can sometimes be on the scale. Uh, Scott Anderson, former CNN. How much do you find the, let's say the word ethical lapses or challenges come from the fact that uh, newsrooms have to produce more, they have more uh, outlets, the individual journalist has much more responsibilities um, than they did before. It's not just file for eight o'clock for the morning newspaper or what have you. It's the continuous filings, it's the podcast, it's, it's the Twittering, what have you. Um, do you see that as a direct uh, correlation to what you consider ethical lapses ha occurring now? Well, I was fascinated by the discussion this morning and, and the CNN example. Um, and there was a recent example at the Times that I wrote about in which uh, they were uh, in a competitive race uh, when Caroline Kennedy withdrew as a, the uh, candidate to be appointed senator to Hillary Clinton's seat, and uh, uh, they wound up posting on the on the the website of the Times uh, anonymous quotes attacking her that were in direct violation of the newspaper's policy, and um, information about her that was just absolutely false, that was leaked by the Patterson uh, Governor Patterson was angry that she pulled out and his people sort of began a whispering campaign against her. Uh, and I thought the Times had acted poorly in that. Uh, you know, I, I have several thoughts about that whole thing. Journalism has always dealt with speed and competitiveness. Um, uh, even in the days of print before the internet, if, if, if something happened at 10 o'clock at night, you're dealing on a very tight window. Um, I don't think that's an excuse to, to uh, uh, set our ethics aside. And, and I don't really think anybody who, who thinks about it in a newsroom believes that's an excuse. But, but I think, and, and there's an argument, which I don't accept myself, that don't worry about it. If it's wrong on the website, it'll get corrected over time as those who know what's right weigh in, either through reader comments or through your own further reporting. But um, that, that argument disturbs me because people see the wrong information. It gets cached, it gets blogged, it gets sent around the world. Uh, people are often not coming back onto the website to, to get corrected information later. And um, I don't think that a good responsible news organization wants to be contributing to misinformation. Um, 
what impact do you think you actually have or your predecessors have had either on the newspaper itself or on the readers with whom you interact? I'm probably the worst person to ask about, about that. Um, I, I know of, of cases where, I, where I'm pretty sure um, there has been impact. And I sometimes hear, literally a reporter the other day told me something uh, and said when, when she was writing this story, she had me in mind um, as somebody, you know, sort of looking um, figuratively over the shoulder. Um, I, I, I know that that people in the Times newsroom do pay attention and, and, and uh, the best impact I think I could have sometimes is to spark a discussion and, and a, a, a robust debate within the newsroom about some of these issues. I wrote a couple of columns recently about anonymous sources and uh, one, of, one of the letters from readers came from the writing coach for the Associated Press who made a suggestion about how anonymous sources should be handled. And as a result of that letter and the columns, the Times has actually adopted his suggestion, uh, which is that quotes from anonymous sources, those that would normally be permissible, not personal attacks and so forth, but even quotes that would normally be permissible, should be paraphrased as much as possible. And the writing coach argued that if you can't paraphrase the quote into something that's not a, an attack or something that you wouldn't otherwise let in the newspaper, it tells you that you shouldn't be using the information. If I understand you, you write three columns a month. Yes. Uh, I'm curious about the process of deciding what those columns would be about, how you <laughs> pick them out of this plethora of ideas, but also uh, how many of them are reader-driven versus perhaps concerns raised from within the institution versus uh, I would be interested in that breakdown. Um, the, the columns have been, uh, I don't know that I could tell you a breakdown, but many of them are reader driven. Sometimes it's only one reader. I, I've written some just based on one reader's letter that was so interesting or raised such a, uh, that, that it captivated me and I went for it. Sometimes as in McCain, it's, it sort of hits you in the face and it's obvious and it's thousands of readers. Um, sometimes I've written about things that I raised myself and that nobody raised to me that I thought I saw. And occasionally uh, people inside the Times have suggested things and, and um, I've, I've thought they were good ideas and have uh, done that too. Back there in the back of the room from the blogosphere. We have a whole bunch for you. Uh, but well, I'll start with just one, uh, which I, I, I'm dying to hear what you have to say. Uh, should our Badger Herald and Daily Cardinal student newspapers have public editors? Um, and would that help build this kind of um, reinforce while, while um, layoffs are happening and we're getting rid of these positions, would that help reinforce with this current generation of reporters growing up, what this role means and what, it, and what you can serve? Well, I believe in the role, so uh, yes, I, I think it would be good to have it at, at those papers. Absolutely. Okay, okay. this one's pretty specific. Um, curious what you thought of the Elliot Spitzer story. Should the New York Times have gone on it with a single source? Should other news organizations have followed so quickly? And is transparency of saying it came from the New York Times enough? I'm not sure I understand the last part of the question. What does that mean? It, I, it, I, I, th I think what the person is saying is for other news organizations, much like what we heard with CNN and the Edwards story this morning, is it enough to say this is from a blogger on Politico? If the Washington Post picked up the story from the New York Times, is it enough to say the Times is reporting? Does that give readers enough information to judge whether I, I to, to judge its credibility? Well, l let me try the first part of it. I, I actually think the Times did a, a, a brilliant job on the Spitzer story, and of course they won a Pulitzer Prize for it. Uh, and I wrote about it at the time and, and said that I thought they did. Um, I, my recollection, the, the person asking the question may be right, but my recollection is that there was not a single source. There was more than that. Um, the Times had been working that story for a while, uh, and um, I, I think that I, I know a little bit more about this than... than is out there and I want to be careful. I, I think that they were guided to, to first the legal documents to take a look at those and then, and then began asking questions. And then the behavior 
um, and I've had some experience with this myself, the behavior of some of the people they were asking questions of was a pretty strong tip-off, not necessarily what was coming out of mouths. Um, I, I thought the, the Times handled the story very responsibly and did quite a good job. Now, the other part is, should other news organizations just say the Times is reporting? And, and we heard an example this morning with CNN and, and, uh, and, and Politico. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a risk people take. I, you know, in that case this morning, I think, I, I'm not surprised that CNN made the decision it did. I think you've got to keep reporting a story on your own and try to get it, but in that sort of superheated atmosphere, I'm not surprised that CNN did it. I would like to think this is so easy, you know, that, that you would refrain and not do it, but uh, it's not surprising in today's environment. Well, internally, on, now we're on. Did you, in, internally on issues within the Times that don't come out of the public columns, and the second, just on the on the question of economics, the the proposals that have been made about you know, some kind of nonprofit solution for the Times, an endowment or other types of approaches. What, what's your take on those suggestions? Uh, no, I don't play any role in the. As I said, and I, you know, I don't I don't have any role in the Times other than what you see and and what I do in, in dealings with readers and, and being a go-between between staff and readers. Um, probably the closest thing is to, after a while, I suggested that they do a training session on how to, um, how to deal with readers uh, because I was, the example I told you was an extreme example, but I've seen some others where uh, reporters were not uh, as polite to a reader as they might have been. And they did hold a training session about that, uh, held two of them actually. Um, nonprofit, um, you know, in, I think that that what's going on now, your organization is wonderful and ProPublica, and there are lots of there's lots of nonprofit models that are experimental, and and are very important, particularly in this low ebb of the business before some new commercial model has been invented. But I think in the long run. Um, the future of the Times is not nonprofit I, uh, or other news organizations like that. I think that they're going to have to figure out a business model that allows them to, to stand alone. Nonprofit suggests um, dependence on some source of funding. And the best source of funding is the free market for news, I believe, um, for at least for a large general circulation newspaper like the New York Times. I was asked recently um, uh, at another university um, if I thought there should be government bailouts for the news industry like, uh, uh, like the auto industry and finance. And of course, that's a disaster. Uh, the news industry is supposed to be the watchdog of government, not taking uh, handouts from it. Uh, so I think ultimately the Times' future is, is got to be commercial. And I believe the time, the, until the deepest part of the recession hit. I know that Arthur Sulzberger and Janet Robinson and the, the business executives of the Times Company believed that the curve of rising internet advertising revenue was going to intersect with the falling curve of print advertising revenue at a point that would sustain the news operation and would begin to turn a profit within a very short time frame. Now, the recession has pushed that out. And, and the Times is going through some very, very tight and very difficult times right now. But the thing it's doing that I think is so important for its future, unlike, I, I heard the term, I believe you used it this morning in a panel, hollowed out. Unlike so many news organizations that are hollowing themselves out to maintain profit margins, um, uh, the Times still has a newsroom budget of $200 million. There are still 1,300 journalists working for the New York Times. Um, and the, the Times is following the often um, expressed but seldom lived up to uh, belief in the news business that, that what 
the value of the product is, is, is news, uh, great journalism. And so when things begin to turn up again, and they will, uh, the Times is going to be in a far stronger competitive position, I think, than news organizations that have hollowed themselves out and don't have that much anymore to give to offer to, to a reading or viewing public. Do you mind if I ask you a question that I've thought of writing to you? No. Uh, this is about um, what You're guaranteed I... guaranteed a response this way. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I think of as the, um, the de-Stalinization of Brett Favre, the former Green Bay quarterback, yep. erstwhile Jets quarterback. What I've noticed the in... The de-Stalinization of him? De-Stalinization. Oh, you've got to explain that. What, well, what I've noticed in the coverage from last year when he signed with the Jets, couldn't have been more enthusiastic, I mean, almost slavish devotion, you know, yeah. now we have breath, this is going to be great. And what I think is so peculiar this year, and I read the sports pages every day, is his retirement, unlike last year, and the Times is not alone in this, but was barely mentioned. You know, you'd think it'd have big coverage. And there was an article last week with the signing of the new quarterback, Sanchez, I'm not sure mm -hmm. about yes. his name. Yes, Mark Sanchez. His signing, yes. and I kept looking for the mention of Favre's name, and it was buried, it was about 10 paragraphs He's down. He's the past, He's the like past. first while <laughs> quarterback. But I think, I think the sports writers are letting their own broken hearts get the better of them, and it just seems peculiar that Brett Favre has been, that's why I say de-Stalinization. It's like we're not even going to mention him. You know, he, he doesn't exist, he didn't exist, and I think it's a very peculiar tone. Well, sports coverage, probably more than, than any other part of news coverage, I think newspaper sports coverage is, and, and actually I think the Times is less guilty of this than most, but it's, it's and USA Today is completely not guilty of it because it doesn't have a hometown. But it's very much hometown oriented. And, and that's what readers want. I, I, I work most of the time in New York, most of the week, but I live in Northern Virginia outside of Washington. That's where my home is. And I am a lifelong, diehard Washington Redskins fan. And when I read the Washington Post and I read coverage about the Redskins, I, you know, I don't want to read about, uh, I, I want it to be Homer coverage, frankly. I want it to be uh, like that. Um, and, and Brett Favre's trajectory in New York was kind of, it, there was great excitement about him. He had some great games, and then clearly he and the team just tailed off, and he's at the end of his career. I'm not surprised that, that you know, it, it moved on that quickly to the future. His first retirement was a, was a major event, and, uh, but I don't know how many times you can retire and have it be a major event. Hi. Um, I wanted to go back to the comment you made earlier about how you're concerned about a, a journalism model where you can put things out on the web and count on uh, readers to then correct errors. I mean, because it, it, it does seem to me that one of the big differences between what I call a journalism 1.0 model, which is the one that, that we operate in, which is that, that it's better to be right than first. And in a journalism 2.0 model, it's better to be first than right. And, and I, I'm thinking about the, the um, uh, Steve Jobs had a heart attack story that appeared on, on CNN I report last fall, uh, caused the, the uh, stock to go down dramatically. In what was a very short period of time, I think only about 15 minutes before Apple responded and, 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 and you know, the, the story was corrected. And for many, many people in, in our world, you know, that... United Airlines bankruptcy, too. Yeah, those kinds of things. And for many people in our world, those, those are appalling examples of the irresponsibility of the web or of, of the blogosphere. And yet for other people who, who work in that world, um, is an example of how the self-correcting mechanism of the web actually does work because the story was corrected so quickly. And what a lot of people there say is that, yes, we'll have more mistakes than, than you might in the mainstream media, but we'll correct them more quickly and more eagerly and, and more generously. And it is a, a, a complaint that you often hear about people in the mainstream media is that they are so reluctant to make complaints. So I'm wondering what your thought is about that because you deal in the complaint department, about whether if we were more generous with our admission of, of errors, then, then perhaps some of the hostility towards us might, might dissipate a bit. Well, I, I, I actually think that, that the, the MSM, the old media 
2.1, um, 1.0, uh, uh, has a long way to go about, about being open and willing to correct. And, and even at the New York Times with a whole corrections uh, set up and, and really a, a great dedication to that, um, there is still um, a lot of resistance internally to correcting error. People, people see it as a career damager and they just won't want to admit a mistake. And I think that's a terrible problem uh, and that, that the more corrections you run, the greater your credibility in a sense because you're, you're transparent and willing to admit your mistakes. But I still have problem, you know, maybe I'm too much of a traditionalist, but I still have problems with this notion of, of a, an organization like the Times putting up information that is wrong and, and sort of feeling comfort and, oh, well, it'll get corrected somewhere down the line. I, I just think it's damaging to credit, that is damaging to credibility. Um. I wanted to see if I could hook together your statement about you cannot tell the newspaper what to publish yeah. with putting lipstick on a pig. Um, one of the things that always disturbs me when I watch Jon Stewart is that even though he says it's fake news, sometimes it's real news. And he did, in my view, the job that the New York Times should have done but chose not to do when he went back and found multiple instances, I don't know if I want to say all of them, when folks had used the phrase putting lipstick on a pig, um, you know, for six, eight, 12 months before it became such a furor. And I wonder, would you ever consider talking to the staff, not, not in the sense of you're trying to censor what, before it goes in the paper, but to say, you know, our political coverage needs to do more of and then fill in the blank with what you think is appropriate. Uh, you know, rather than always being reactive to something that's been printed. You, you know, it's a, it's a fair question, but here's, here's the problem. If I start suggesting what coverage should be and the people who are really responsible for the coverage decide that they have other priorities, or if I, if I suggest what coverage should be and they follow it and don't execute it terribly well in my view, I, I, I think it begins to create a sort of an intolerable tension and conflict. When I first went there, um, I went to news meetings for a while just to get oriented. Well, I wasn't yet gonna be writing a column, I was just learning about the times and its culture. And after the third news meeting, I was sitting in the news meeting and they were talking about a page one story. And as I listened to them talk about it, I thought, wow, this could be, if they don't handle this just right, this could be a mess. Uh, and, and I sat there and I was very uncomfortable. And I thought, it's not my role to say something to them. And yet, if I were in the I was not yet in the column writing mode, but if I had been, and if, had, if it had not been handled properly and readers had complained about it, then I'm sort of sitting there like the fool who listened to it all, didn't say anything, and now I'm, now I'm beating them up about it. And from that moment forward, I, I said, I'm not gonna uh, participate, I won't do that. I, I, I just don't think I can, I realize it does put me in a reactive mode and a, and a post rather than a pre-mode, but I think that's kind of where the public editor has to be, um, because you can't be both referee one minute and, and coach the next, I, I, or, or even ball carrier. I just don't think that works. Sorry for the sports metaphor. We have I tried two to very, your questions, do we have time for two more? One from, okay. okay. Do, is there any more from back in the blog world? That's the last one. I should preface this by saying I'm a former member, uh, employee of McClatchy newspapers. So I'm uncomfortable, and I was thinking about this when you were talking about the New York Times management positioning itself not to hollow out the Times, to present newspapers as somehow hapless victims of the economy without recognizing that there were management decisions that also contributed to the state that newspapers are in. And regarding the New York, not the New York Times in particular, but certainly the New York Times company, it's done an outstandingly good job of hollowing out the Boston Globe. And I wonder if you can address that larger picture of management's contribution to the state that some of these large news, urban newspapers are in. Certainly true of McClatchy. Well, 
I don't know a lot about the details of the Boston Globe's um, situation, but I know that, that um, it's a very difficult, in one way, it's a dream market for a newspaper. Uh, Harvard and MIT and Boston University and Boston College and on and on and on. Uh, it's a highly engaged, literate uh, uh, city and, and one that deserves a, a terrific newspaper. The Times paid a billion dollars for the Boston Globe, the most money ever paid for uh, a newspaper in the United States, sort of near the, not quite at, but near the peak of the newspaper uh, market, took on a lot of debt to buy it. Uh, and then uh, lots of things started going wrong. Uh, the largest uh, advertiser of, uh, in the Boston Globe was Filene's, which is no longer in business, doesn't exist anymore. And um, uh, all the trends that we've been talking about with Craigslist killing classified and all the rest that we know just have really pulled the globe down. And I think it's, uh, uh, this is what I believe, I've never talked to Arthur Sulzberger or others about this, but I think there's no question in my mind anyway that the, that the Sulzberger family views the, the New York Times as the jewel, a, as that which must be protected at all costs. And the margins at other Times company papers have always been higher. Uh, they haven't, you know, it's not, it's not equal treatment for all. Um, and, it, and it clearly, uh, it seems to me, has not been equal treatment for the Boston Globe. The, the big difference, so you, you, do, you do need to cut them some slack in this one way. The New York Times newspaper, as I understand it, I'm not privy to the numbers, but as I understand it, and the Times doesn't break these out, but I believe the New York Times newspaper, at least up to the first quarter of this year, was profitable as a standalone business. The, it was generating more cash than it was spending, even with the big investment in news, news staff uh, resources. The Boston Globe is losing money, and losing a lot of money. I think the number was $85 million it was on course uh, per year to lose. And, and that's not sustainable. One last, oh, my goodness, sorry. One last question from our uh, from our online participants, and that is, um, given that you're the third public editor, and the circumstances in which that position was established, um, are newspapers in general, your newspaper specifically, trying to be more ethical or trying to show um, readers and others more clearly the ethics that you have always had? I, I think the Times has always had the ethical standards, and they've been very high standards. They clearly. Um, uh, were not lived up to in the Jason Blair case. And, and that the public editor is maybe only the most obvious change that uh, came from that. There was a whole uh, uh, commission that, that the Times uh, uh, put together, and a lot of internal changes were made to address uh, issues, including uh, a lot of staff training that didn't take place before. There were, there were written ethics guidelines, but uh, um, people were required to read them when they became an employee, but then there was not really ongoing training. There was also a lot of concern because of the way Jason Blair sort of just shot up through the paper and many people felt it, his advancement was quite unfair based on merit. Uh, there's been a great deal more attention paid to staff development and, and internal transparency and, and personnel issues. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to thank our guest, uh, Tark Hoyt. Uh, if you look at newsrooms and you say, well, what components within the structure of a newspaper or a news organization could contribute uh, to ethical standards, their maintenance, and their furtherance? Uh, lots of people talk about ombudsmen and public editors, so it's wonderful to hear your take on it uh, today. Thank you very much. Again. Thanks, Dave.